All right, I just hit record, and the technology gods are not on our side today. But Sarah Kroger, <laughs> it's an honor to have you here on the Beyond Sunday Aww. podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm excited to be with you and just, yeah, have a conversation, hang out, drink some coffee, wake up, <laughs> and of, hopefully the technology will be with us. Hopefully, hopefully. So mm -hmm. what coffee you got there? That looks like an iced coffee with a little cream. It is an iced coffee. Uh, I actually made my own cold brew this morning. Wow. Actually, last night because it takes like twenty four hours. Yeah, it's super easy. It's not. It's not anything fancy. You just take gro coffee grounds and shake it in a bottle of water, and then you have cold brew the next day. I'm sure there's way fancier coffee people out there who are like, no, you have to do it this way, and the temperature of the water has to be so so. But no, I don't. It's just as easy as that. So cold brew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm one of those, I guess you could say coffee snobs. And so I have... I appreciate people like you. I do. Like, I do. Like I do the like grind the beans every morning and like do the pour yeah. over and I have all the like gear. I don't have expensive gear, but I have a lot of... I get it. Coffee gear. And I, I have I've struggled with like cold coffee, like cold brew... Mm iced coffee i've just never been able to like fully enjoy it i just like a hot yeah. cup of coffee so but is there something about like the nuance of flavor that you can taste in a hot cup that you can't taste in a cold cup is that the thing you think or maybe 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 it's just the know. ritual and the routine of it like even if it's like i live in orlando yeah. and maybe even if it's like 110 oh, cool. outside like i'm getting a hot <laughs> cup of coffee like i'm just not gonna get some cold coffee it's so weird Anyway, yeah, um, no, I get it. We could go down that rabbit hole. My brother's a real uh, coffee snob as well. And I, I have an appreciation for it. I just don't have time for it in my life, you know, but I'm deeply into sourdough. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so I get <laughs> I get the nuances or like the 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 ability to like really dig into something. You know so what I mean? Sourdough. So I appreciate it. That's that's a passion yeah. of yours. Like, do you make your own sourdough? Very recent passion, but I am very deeply obsessed. <laughs> like immediately, I've only made three loaves and I love it. I don't know why. I'm gluten free, but I, I found out recently that I can tolerate sourdough, which is a game changer because that means that I can have wow. a sandwich now that doesn't fall apart and is actually like the bread is good for you and it's easier to digest all these things. So I started making my own and it is a whole thing. There's lots of details, lots of different ways to do it, but I've learned a lot about about life through making sourdough. I've learned a lot already, so That's yeah, incredible. That's my you, you might have just set some of our listeners free. Like they're they may be gluten-free wow. and maybe they can handle sourdough and they just didn't realize it. Yeah. Obviously it's a consult real thing. consult your doctor. You know, this is not Absolutely. medical advice, but <laughs> No, no, it's not medical advice, but it's really fascinating. It's just, it's some, there's something about the, the process. It's fermented, so it's like natural, and it breaks down the gluten way easier. It also like, it's, it's a whole thing. I'm not going to go into it. I'm not a scientist, but go do your own research with it, and it's changed my life, truly. As a gluten-free person, it's changed my life. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. Um, there's just sometimes you just need bread. Like to go like the, the rest of your life like the real without thing. bread is like, man, that's just torture. It's just not right. I I agree. I agree wholeheartedly, truly. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. So it's changed my life, truly. That and then being able to eat it in Italy, which is a whole other whole other discussion. But wow, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I can eat it in Italy, but I have to go to Italy to eat it. <laughs> right. You well, know. anyways. Well, now that we got our best content out of the way. <laughs> You know, we'll, we'll, we'll dive in. I'm excited to coffee just, and bread, coffee and bread. Right. No, but Sarah, you know, I kind of newer to your, to your music and have just been diving in the last couple of weeks, kind of preparing for this conversation and just excited to chat. Like I'd love to maybe start awesome. with how did you get started as a worship leader? This podcast is kind of for like people in worship ministry and, you know, a little bit of songwriters here and there, people in ministry, but yeah. a lot of worship leaders. So how did you get your start? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my parents are both involved in music ministry from before I was born. So music okay. was always a big part of our life. You know, I was 
forced to be a part of the children's choir at church or, you know, take piano lessons and voice lessons and all the things. I hated it at the time, but now I'm like, I'm so grateful for that because it just built this foundation of a love for for music and music in the church specifically and ministry, you know, Uh, kind of like a pastor's kid a little bit. And so, yeah, I just grew up with this love for music, but I was terrified for the longest time to sing in front of people because I was bullied a lot in elementary school. And so, I wouldn't have been able to verbalize it like this when I was a kid, but I think it was this gift to me. It was really precious to me. It was music was such a a special thing and a vulnerable thing. And so I just kind of built up a wall because I was like, I don't want anyone else to tear that down. Like they've torn this other side of me down. And so I hid it for the longest time. And then I went on a youth conference when I was a junior in high school. Matt Marr was leading worship, and it was the first time that I experienced contemporary worship. Before that, I was much more, I was raised Catholic, and so much more of, I would say, in a traditional environment, and that was the first time I heard contemporary worship, and it gave language to connect with God in a personal way for the first time ever in my life. I'd never thought about God as like being able to have a relationship with him. And it was really through the music that that taught me how to pray and how to connect for the first time ever. And there was a a speaker on that retreat and he was speaking to the whole room, but it felt like this moment where the light was just shining right on me. And he said, if you have a gift from God and you're not using it, you're denying the glory of God within you. And I felt called out and I felt like God was lovingly saying, Sarah, I'm, I'm asking you to step out in faith. And I went back to my church after that and I started singing and volunteering on Sundays and I get emotional even talking about it because it was such a defining moment in my life. I was this close to allowing fear to keep me from becoming who God invited me to be, who God made me to be, and stepping into this this life of, of music that I really felt called to, and I was really close to not, to not. And so, yeah, I just started volunteering and slowly but surely gaining confidence with every single time I did it. I mean, in the, in the early days of leading worship, I probably sounded like a dying donkey every single time, like just like, ah, you know, I was so terrified. It's not like I said yes and everything was great and everything went away. Still to this day, I get nervous sometimes when I'm on stage, you know, I think that's a good, healthy thing. But at the time, you know, it was terrifying and then just slowly but surely gained confidence and and now this is what I do full time. I can't imagine doing anything else. It's the love of my life, you know? It's what I'm so passionate about besides sourdough. <laughs> but truly, no, like truly, like I can't imagine doing anything else. And it's, yeah, it's just wild to look back on your life and see the ways that God opens the doors and lovingly pushes you beyond what you think you can do. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. I was just having this conversation with my daughter yesterday because mm. I'm you know, I'm leading worship this Sunday and, and I was like, Ellie, you want to, she's 10. I was like, Ellie, do you want to, do you want to sing with me on Sunday? And she's, she's not really a singer, but I think she could be, but she was like, no. And and I was like, why? She's like, I just, I don't like being in front of people is essentially what she said, you know? And, and then I was like, well, Ellie, if, if God called you to sing, would you do it then? And she's like, hmm. Probably. I probably would if he (laughs) called me to, you know? So there is something about that. There's something about like, you know, where God sort of has a calling on your life, you know, and not allowing fear of whatever, you know, to to hold you back from, from fully stepping into that. But I think it oftentimes, like in, in my case, like it, it takes other people saying, Hey, you can do this, you know, cause I don't know. I didn't have a lot of belief in myself, but it was people that came around me and said, wow, God's, God's got something on your life. You need to step out there. You exactly. This, you know, exactly. Yeah. That's the power of community. You know, that's yeah. the power of other people in your life, encouraging you, even your parents. My parents were like that too. They just would not let me let it go. You know, and I'm, I am grateful for that at the time. I was like, oh, just stop telling me to sing, you know, like just stop telling me that I have a good voice. I don't want to hear it. And, you know, but yeah. now I'm just grateful that again, that I had people around me that were encouraging me. Like you're saying, it's a gift. What did you learn from your parents? I always find that interesting Mm. how, you know, when you have parents that are worship leaders or in some sort of field, and then you find yourself kind of gravitating into a similar space, a different expression maybe, but like doing a similar (laughs) thing. Like what did you learn from them, maybe Mm. directly or indirectly? 
That's a great question. I've actually never been asked that question. I try not so to I just really ask the it. standard questions. <laughs> like, we're going deep yeah. here. We're talking sourdough, <clears throat> coffee, and yeah. parents. Yeah, and parents. Let's go on the deep end <laughs> of the pool. No, I, you know, honestly, on a practical level, I think I learned from them that ministry is not perfect. It's messy, and mm. it involves human beings, and... It can be easy from the outside to look in and think, oh, everything, everyone must treat each other with respect all the time. And it must be this golden place to work and just the best situation at all times. And sometimes it really, truly is. I'm not trying to to downplay that. Sometimes it's a really healthy environment, but sometimes it is a really toxic environment. And so I think I just learned from a very young age to not put people on a pedestal to recognize that people are human beings, to give grace and and also recognize that, yeah, people are imperfect. And it kind of like burst that bubble really early, which I think is just helpful, yeah, to just recognize all of us are human, all of us are bringing baggage and complicated lives into ministry and it's not always perfect. And just, just like I'm not perfect, you know, I'm imperfect and I'm bringing my own baggage into it. And just like recognizing we're all broken people and that God uses broken people over and over again. And thank God for that, you know? Yeah. It's, it's definitely humbled me in that way. And continually in my ministry, just recognizing like, oh, I actually don't have to be perfect in order to do ministry. (laughs) I feel like there's this pressure, maybe from the outside, or maybe it's just like social media world, just making you, you feel like you have to be a certain way in order to be in ministry and have all the answers. And it's like, I, I really don't. I'm just trying to be a student. I'm trying to learn every single day. And I think that upbringing really helped me to have that as a foundation for this ministry life, you know? Yeah, it's funny how we we do place leaders and even artists just on a pedestal. Like oh, maybe, yeah. maybe it's just human nature, but I'll never fully understand mm. it. Like these are just humans like doing something God's gifted them to do, but we sort of like worship them in a sense so it must be just it's just in our nature to do that we got to realize the humanity in people and even as artists and leaders ourselves like understand our own weaknesses and like limitations yeah. and not allow it to feed into our you know psyche too much you know it's just an interesting interesting thing how we're wired as as humans <laughs> yeah i i agree with that i think that's part of Oh, man, I don't know if you want to go here, but I think that's part of the problem with where things have been going uh, on a church level these days is like holding leaders on like putting them on this pedestal and and like leaders not having accountability. And then it turns into this really toxic thing where we treat them like little gods, you know, and then it just the higher they get, the, the longer they have to fall and the more impact that has. And it's just. Yeah, it's just a problem across the board. And so I I really am trying, at least in my own life, to just lead from a place of humility constantly and surrender, just recognizing like I I do not have it all together. I am just trying to make it through this life that's hard and complicated and trying constantly to submit myself to God and recognize like anybody could fall trapped to pride and to the ways of the world anyone can any one of us are we're not immune to that and we need to constantly as people in ministry surrender ourselves and submit our will to his and i think that's the best place for us to be you know well yeah and that's so relatable you know Mm. and i was having this conversation too with with pat barrett like a few weeks ago just kind of talking about Mm. songwriting And it was like, sometimes as a songwriter, you can try to write something that's going to resonate with people and totally miss the mark. But when you are just a little bit more like brutally honest about what you're walking through and who you are, like that actually is what resonates with people. You know, it's not sort of this abstract, what does the church want to sing? What, what does my market want to hear? It's like, you know what, let me just be super raw and in that like uncomfortable process you find yeah. people resonating. Have, has, has that, have you found that to be true for you? Yes, deeply. That's why I'm smiling over here and just shaking my head because I, <laughs> yes, that is 
very, very, very true. And in my own songwriting, I've, I've seen that over and over again, that the songs that resonate with people are the ones that I don't necessarily think are going to or that I'm really uncomfortable with sharing because they're so raw and so honest and come from such a vulnerable place that I'm like, ah, I don't know that anyone will be able to relate to this. This feels too deeply personal, but that's always the one that breaks through or that someone says to me that really changed my life or that really met me in my darkest moment. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that because I need that too. You know, I need those tools to navigate the darkness just as much as the light of this faith journey and this complicated journey that is faith, you know, that has good days and bad days and recognizing that as a, as an artist, as a songwriter, yeah, it's just helped me to write from that place and try to be more honest. It's, it's not easy though. It's not, it's not, it's not always the most fun to go there and it's not always the most fun to, to share those things, but I'm grateful for the people who are kind in their response to it. I will say that too. Yeah. Well, I think vulnerability, when you're vulnerable, it helps other people be vulnerable. You know, yeah. if someone can see, Hey, she's not hiding or he's, he's not hiding then I can be yeah. open about my own struggle or my own pain and not feel like I have to like suppress it or whatever, you know, like bring it out into the light and bring it into the presence yeah. of God. And, and, and Sarah, yeah. that's what I, what I love about, um, you know, your music. Like, I don't even know like how you categorize yourself. We love categories, you know, as, <laughs> as people, but like, like yeah. if you're like a worship artist or you write worship music, I mean, there's, yeah. it's obvious that you have like worship songs in what you do, but there's, you've really found a way to balance like kind of raw honesty and, you know, just like worship music and kind of mm. those things kind of like working together. Like a lot of worship music can sometimes feel a little like just not totally relatable or it just mm. doesn't hit people in in the right season, you know, and you've mm. just kind of found this way to almost blend the vulnerable singer songwriter world mm. with like church worship and theology. Anyway, I'm just yeah. like throwing things out there, but talk about how you approach <laughs> that, like how you think about the music that you make. I love that. I really appreciate your insight and, and like your words with that, because that really has been kind of my intention is like, I mean, I'm just such a fan of so many different kinds of music and I listen to so many different kinds of music personally and I have experienced spiritual like moments with all kinds of music that's outside of just like church worship music, you know, like that's classified as worship music. And I, a, a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, a couple of years ago kind of challenged me with that. He was like, you know, we say worship music, but like worship could be any kinds of like any kind of music, you know, yeah, it's just any kind if of it's sound. leading you. Yeah. If it's leading you to the heart of God, to the mystery of God, to the wonder of God, to me, it's like, that's, that's, that's an act of worship. You know, it might not have been the artist's intention for it to be worship. You know, like sometimes I listen to a John Mayer song and I'm like, I am led to the feet of Jesus right now. I don't know why, but I don't know what it is. It's like, because God is not bound by our boxes, right? Like he's found in beauty and in goodness and in truth, ultimately, you know? So I find that in all kinds of genres. And so when it came to especially this new record, I was just like, I want to make music that I love listening to, that I could listen on the background or when I'm driving in California down the coast or, you know, I'm originally from Florida. So like when I'm in Florida and I'm just driving to the ocean, I want to be able to just like vibe out to some songs. And so my approach with this record was really like, I want some artistic sounding songs and I want some songs that are for the church specifically that the church can actually use that that sound like that and then everything in between and we kind of like kind of threw it all in there and this project is kind of a mix of both of those things exactly what you're saying you know because I really am passionate about that that worship doesn't have to be one particular thing and I feel like we've made it one particular thing and it just doesn't have to be you know so I want to continue to challenge that even for myself. Like what is worship yep. to me? It's turning my heart, anything that turns my heart and my eyes and my voice towards God and recognizing his, again, his beauty, truth, and goodness at work in the world, you know? Yeah. 
So let's dive into your influences a little bit. I'm curious as to like, so maybe twofold question. What's influenced your sound the most? Yeah. From the sonic quality of your music to even your songwriting, like who's been the biggest influence or influences. And then also as a worship leader, like literal, like corporate worship leading, who's kind of influenced you the most in both of those worlds. Yeah. That's a great question. I think the sound one most recently, I drew a lot of references from Maggie Rogers and Casey Musgraves, specifically both of them. I just love how they make soundscapes out of their tracks. They just, and that's what I, my goal and dream with this project was, because it's a lot of it has to do with this theme of wonder. And I just wanted, I wanted it to be encapsulated like through sound, that idea, that tangible feeling of like just wonder and electricity when you're in beauty, when you're in nature, to be able to feel that sonically. And they are two artists that I feel like just have figured out how to do that sonically. So we pulled a lot of references from them and also Sarah McLaughlin and I mean like Peter Gabriel, I mean all kinds of different places. So that was sonic references. And then worship leaders for me, I mean, I I mean, Pat Barrett is one of them, Matt Marr, definitely someone that I've always looked up to and has kind of been like a mentor to me slash uncle in the best way, like just such a a champion for me in the past. And he produced some some songs on this record and other worship leaders. I mean, I could name so many. I love Bethel, the way that they do their tracks. I was going to say, I hear a lot of like for a long time. Amanda, Amanda. Yeah. Amanda Cook, Stephanie Gretzinger, I mean, all of those. Leland, oh my gosh, Leland's last record, City of God, is honestly one of my favorite records of the last few years. Did Uh, I hear, did I hear his voice on a song on this record? I was going to say, I was listening through it and I'm like, that is Leland, just an unmistakable voice. (laughs) it just pierces through the night it does no it really does honestly but yeah he's on he's on a track we wrote uh, a track together and he he graciously sang on it so yeah a lot of those people i would say it's it's kind of a a nice mix of all that a melting pot if you will yeah yeah so sarah what comes most naturally for you as a as a songwriter is it lyrics or is it melody like what do you have to wrestle with more oh i have to wrestle with lyrics a lot more than melody. I'm hearing melody all day long. My voice memos are full of melody little snippets. Like, what do you think of that? You know, like I'll just sing in my car. Most of the time I can't even understand it later because I'm like driving in the car. It's super loud road noise and I'm just trying to sing into my phone just to get something down. But yeah, I'm definitely a melody girl. I'm I'm led by melody, but I've been honestly ever since moving to Nashville, just really grown a lot in my lyric writing, just being surrounded by people who are way better than me. That's the beauty and the art of co-writing. And yeah, it's just such a gift, truly. I don't I don't think any of my songs would exist without co-writing. So I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. For sure. What's your yeah. what's your like a typical day like in terms of mm. I guess just songwriting? Like you get an idea, you sing into your voice memo, then are you the kind of person that kind of goes to, you know, a piano or a guitar or some kind of software instrument and starts producing a track? Take us mm. into your process. Yeah, I I would love to say that that's what I do because I want to, I actually really want to learn Logic more and learn how to build my demos more. I only know how to really do like piano and basic pads on Logic right now and then how to do my voice, you know, with Re- Reverb. But no, I think I'm a I'm a slow processor. So I it takes a little bit more time for me. If I know that I have a co-write on the schedule, for example, I'll go through my voice memos or I'll, I'll I really try to read a lot as much as possible because I'm trying to just soak up inspiration and, and just kind of like figure out what I want to write about even and what's inspiring me, what's what's keeping me up at night, you know, what am I thinking about? What am I processing? And like I said, I'm a slow processor. So it takes me some time to like really like chew on things. And um, even in a co-write situation, I've learned that I'm I'm even slow in those spaces. So the people that I choose to write with, like 
I need people who are willing to allow space, silence, and let me <laughs> percolate a little bit because it just, yeah, it just takes me a little bit more time. I don't know why. It's just the way that my brain is wired. I really struggled with that in the beginning. I was like, why can't I think more fast and on my feet? Why can't I just have, you know, be flowing like everyone else does who's a lyric writer or a top line writer or whatever, but that's just not my gift and that's okay. You know, I, I find myself drawing from other people's strengths and I have other strengths and that's the beauty again of co-writing like you find yourself in a space where you can make something that didn't exist before because the three of you came together or the two of you came together and so yeah yeah I I find myself just processing slower and just kind of taking my time to prepare for like a co-write or and of course I'll come to my piano and just kind of mess with things or mess with lyrics and mumble things or whatever but yeah, that's more of my process. It's a slower kind of thing, for sure. What's the co-write that you were like most nervous about? Like you saw it on the calendar and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous to step into this <laughs> session. Oof. The one that comes immediately to mind is writing with Leland and Matt Marr. And it's just because they're legends. <laughs> they're like some of my favorite worship leaders and artists of this day and age that we live in. And I was just like, what is going to happen here? I don't, I don't really know. But honestly, as soon as I walk, I mean, Matt and I have been friends for a while. And so that, that wasn't as much of a nervous energy as much as like, but I also just deeply respect him as a, as a writer. He is such He's like a prophet. I mean, he really is as a writer. He's so incredible to just watch him and the way that he does it and his process and the things he comes up with is just insane. I've learned so much from him, but Leland is kind of the same way. And so going in there, I was just like, oh, how is this going to happen? But it was such an awesome write. It was such a great, yeah, it was such a great collaboration. And we came out with a song that I just, I so in love with. It's called Giving Up. It's on the record. And it hits you like a freight train. And yeah, I just love it. And they were so kind and gave me space again to be vulnerable and to process. And I'm just really grateful for that. So I was nervous going into it, but it ended up being just fine. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So yeah. you mentioned doing a lot of reading. Yeah. What What are some things that you have been reading books or otherwise that you've just drawn inspiration from, you know, say in the last yeah. year or two? Yeah. That's a great question. I most recently, and I mean, this is just in the last like few months, the book that has really helped me in this season is a book called The Night is Your Friend by, oh my gosh, Alicia Britt Nicole, I want to say. So I've been walking through a season of my faith journey that I never anticipated and that I've never walked through before, which is just like a, a season of desolation and the desert of really wrestling with some questions and my prayer life, like just not working in the way that it used to. And I've never, ever struggled with faith before. So it was such a a thing that came out of left field and I just wasn't sure what to do with it. And it was really difficult. And so honestly, over the last year, like it, it's, I haven't really been reading a ton because I just have needed a break. Yep. And this book has kind of been the first thing that's broken through and has helped me to make sense of what I've been walking through and and just like paint a different picture of the fact that like disillusionment and and doubt and specifically like desolation periods of desolation are just as much of a gift as periods of consolation and the, to be able to actually say that without feeling anger or bitterness about it is like a recent breakthrough and actually like a recent clearing of the clouds of just, yeah, despair, honestly, for the last year. And wow. I'm really grateful for this book because it's just helping me to make sense and to kind of like navigate it and just recognize like, okay, I actually think there's a purpose to this and that God uses everything for his glory. And ultimately that this season is going to lead to fruit that I would never get to if I had tried to skip over it or tried to run away from it. So yeah, not to go into the deep end of the pool with that, but that's honestly where I've been. And this book has really helped me. So the night is normal. Go check it. Or the night is your friend. Either the night is normal or the night is your friend. I can't remember, but we'll link, um, it, up. We'll link it up. We'll find the right title. No, that's yeah. great. Check so, it out for sure. The song, no filter. Did that song kind of come out of this season? 
because yeah i i just love that song it is well it's, it's beautiful first off just everything about it from the arrangement to your vocals but it's also there's a little bit of like you're almost challenging god a little bit like you can feel the tension a little bit you know like you yeah. want me here i am like no more hiding you know, no filter like it's just wow super raw and some <laughs> Some people are even just not even yeah. willing to, to go there. You know, we put on a happy face mm. and just keep going. So talk about sort of the writing of that song and, yeah. you know, that season. Yeah, I so appreciate you saying that. I really do because when we, you know, we talked about honesty and songwriting earlier and vulnerability, and that is definitely the most vulnerable song I've ever written and for sure the most vulnerable song I've ever released and it came from for sure this season. And and I even I hate even calling it a season because I don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, I don't. I do believe that it is a season, though. I do believe that there's always resurrection on the other side of death because that's the way that God works. So and I've seen that at work in my life. And so in this time of, you know, darkness, I have to cling on to that hope and that history that we have and seeing him do it over and over again, believing that he's going to do it again. But that song, yeah, it, I wrote it with a dear friend and I told her what I had been walking through and she and I just wrote it in 30 minutes. It was like a download, you know, because I think both of us had experienced the same kind of thing. And I remember writing it and I wanted to go into the corner and like die, like literally just die wow. and th or throw up. I mean, I was just so nervous and so overcome with like, I can't, I can't, this is too personal. This is too raw. I can't, I can't share this with my label, let alone like release this thing. Like this thing is not coming out. This song is just <laughs> for me. You know, when you write a song and you're like, this, that was just for me. It's fine. Right. Yeah. That for sure was how I felt. But as soon as I showed it, started showing it to people, people were like, you have to release this song. And my label was like, "That? How, what do you think about that being the first song that you released from this record? <laughs> I was like, ah. But I'm so grateful for that. Again, I'm grateful for community of people who rallied around it and who said, Sarah, you have to just step out in bravery and know that there's other people who are wrestling like you are. Yes. And that is exactly what has been What's been happening is I was terrified. I thought people were going to be like, she's an atheist. She's not a believer anymore. She And it's like uh, wrestling with faith does not equal the same thing as literally walking away. You know what I mean? Like yep. it's it's different things. And and so that's what this song has led into conversations about is just recognizing this is a part of the faith journey. And we can't escape it. Sometimes it happens when we least expect it and it is okay. Like it's okay to wrestle. It's okay to say to God, the things that are scaring us deeply and terrifying us, those things that we can't say to anybody else. He wants us to be brutally honest with him. If we can't be brutally honest with God, who the heck can we be honest with? Honestly. And it's, it's one of those things that like, wrestling will make you think that you have to like stay in isolation. I feel like that's a tool of the evil one. Stay in isolation. Don't say this to anybody. Don't reveal this to anybody. Like, and then it starts to make you think like you're crazy and, and it just starts to spiral in your head and just eats you alive. Yeah. And if there's anything I've learned in this season, it's like, God, God wants us just as we are in every single aspect of our life. He just wants us as we are because it's ultimately good for us to wrestle through these things and to expose our heart to him and and to bring our heart to him, whether it's broken, whether it's, uh, he doesn't want our perfect, perfected selves. We're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. He wants to walk with us through the crap, like through the gunk, through the real stuff, because that's where the gold is is made, you know? So yeah. that's really what this song, where that came to be. And I'm, I'm grateful for the reception of it. I'm grateful for people bringing their own honesty to it and, and seeing themselves reflected in it and recognizing that we're just not, we're not alone. You know, if you're wrestling, you're not alone. You're not crazy. It's all a part of the journey and it's normal. You know, the night is normal. So yeah, that's there's, my hope is that people experience that. There's a difference between doubt and deconstruction. Yeah. You know, and deconstruction these last, you know, five years. Buzzword. So, just a huge buzzword. And yeah. And I get it. And I think sometimes people can applaud deconstruction, you know, as honesty and, 
you know, everybody's mm-hmm. kind of on their own journey. But what the difference I see is with deconstruction is you're sort of walking away from God. You're sort of removing yourself from the presence of God and like figuring yeah. things out like outside of that. And that can be a very slippery slope, kind of dangerous. Yeah. But doubt is God, here I am. I'm not going anywhere, but this is the reality of my situation and I need you. I'm not trying to yeah. fake anything. And it's sort of like a, a pressing into the presence of God with yeah. your questions instead of walking away. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, that's it. And that's kind of what I've been trying to like, even figure out what it is that I'm walking through because deconstruction is the only word we have these days. Right. But like, again, that's why I say desolation and consolation. That's been like a, pr- yeah. a spiritual practice, even in Catholic spaces for centuries. I mean, the saints talk about it, you know, like way back in the day. And so it's not like it's a new thing. It's just deconstruction is like the buzzword. And and I know there are people out there who have been deeply hurt by the church, who feel like that's their only option is to leave. And maybe the Lord will bring them back at some point. That is their journey. But for me, it wasn't deconstruction as much as it was an unraveling of like, I need to unravel some bad theology that I have, bad practices, bad ways of thinking about God that were never him in the first place. And that is what this process has allowed me to do is unravel the the not good and the the not good ways of thinking about him from the from the truth, you know? And sometimes you need something like this to like really like sift through yeah. those parts of your life. And actually if you look at the if you look at the Psalms, it's all over the Psalms. Like the yeah the process of un- unraveling and raveling and just death and resurrection over and over again that's just the practice of christian life and and we somehow forget about it or we just don't like to talk about it because it's not it's not the pretty jesus is the victor you know conversation it's like yeah what about when i can't feel him what about when i can't hear him what about when i feel completely alone finding faith beyond feelings has been the challenge for me and recognizing that faith is not feelings, you know, like it's believing in what you cannot see over and over and over again. So yeah, it's been a journey and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the ways that the songs on this record have captured that journey. And even listening back to it myself, it has been a gift to me listening back to it. And, and so it just feels like this thing that's even beyond me. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that, you know, Yeah, prayer yeah, yeah. prayer doesn't have to be polished. I love that you brought up the Psalms because it's such a great example. You know, I yeah. don't remember the last time I prayed a prayer like, oh God, break the teeth of the wicked, you know, or like <laughs> you know what I mean? And like these are like these are like actual scripture. Yeah. Like if we actually look at the Bible and like break yeah. it down, there are so many uh, dare I say most of the Bible that we just sort of overlook that's like <laughs> That's in the Bible? Like, are you serious? I know. Because we we sort of almost pick and choose like the feel good parts, but there's so Absolutely. much there, and that speaks to like God's presence in the midst of all of our human experience. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I mean, one one psalm that I've really really drawn strength from in the last few months has been from Psalm 22 which is the psalm that Jesus himself quoted from the cross. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Like, that's in the Bible. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) that's a prayer and a real moment from a real human being saying this, this prayer, you know, this honest, just, I can't feel you. Why have you left me? And recognizing like, oh, you can say the hard things to God. You can, and you can still write the rest of the Psalms. You know what I mean? Like you could still be in the Bible forever and ever, and you could still be used by your, your words can still be used by believers forever. You know, it's just wild. It's wild the way that God works. And yeah, he truly just desires us truly. And if there's anything I've learned, it's that. What's, what's even wild, even more wild about that is that comes from God himself, fully God, but yet fully man dealing with doubt (laughs) why have you forsaken me you know fear that's insane Mm -hmm. when you actually think about it you know it's really (laughs) mind-blowing it really is a (laughs) mind-blowing emoji you know yeah all over the place sarah what's a what's a song on this new project that surprised you the most yeah uh, well there's a song 
it's not on the main record, but it's going to be on the deluxe record that's called Ooh. Galaxies. Yeah, there's there's a deluxe record coming right after the record releases because I just couldn't whittle down all the songs. But there's a song called Galaxies, and it is, I wrote it with Leslie Jordan, and we wrote it like as a worship song, like slow and kind of like mellow and contemplative. And then it turned into, I can't even describe, it's like this like California windows down you're in a you're in a convertible like rolling down the the pacific coast highway just (laughs) vibing out vibe it is like surfer vibes just the most fun thing to listen to but it's it's a worship song like the the lyrics are about like the the wonder and the awe of god and the holiness like the bridge is like holy holy to the lord almighty you know but it is such a vibe so that one i think just surprised me the most because I was really expecting us to just go down the worship, the traditional like worship music lane with it. What was the catalyst for like changing the vibe? Like what happened? (laughs) So I wrote, I I had that song produced by Kaysen Cooley, who does a lot of Need to Breathe's records, Drew Holcomb's records, Ellie Holcomb. And then Matt co-produced it, Matt Marr. And we were just sitting there and kind of like Matt started playing this guitar riff. And then we were like, okay, let's like, Let's chase that down for a minute. And then we started pulling out different references and then it just kind of like slowly snowballed. And then it became something we were like, this is really cool. Let's just go with it, you know? And I, we kind of just went with it and I was like, this is, I don't think what the label anticipated, but let's go with it, you know? And then we just kind of kept building the track and then we showed it to my A&R and he was kind of like, at first, like, I don't know, guys, I'm not really sure. (laughs) But we just kind of kept like staking our claim in that ground and just like, yeah, no, this is the thing. This is it. We got to go in this direction. We got to lean in. And we just did. And I'm just so grateful that we did because it's such a, yeah, it's like that convergence of artistry and worship music at the same time. That is that song. I'll send it to you or I'll have somebody at the label send it to you so you can hear it because it's such a, yeah, yeah, I can't describe it other than saying it is such a vibe. It just really is. So I that one surprised me probably the most. That's awesome. That's, <laughs> you know, I think there's there's so many tensions in this, right? Like with worship music, because you can think, okay, how do we arrange this or record it in a way that's just going to be the most corporate, what's going to be the easiest for churches to latch on to and do. And I, and I get that too, but in some ways there's just the, the sort of raw creative freedom that I feel can be just missing sometimes. Like, let's just, let's go for this. Let's, let's push this beyond you know, may- maybe where we thought, you know, are there other yeah. aspects of, of this collection of songs that you tried to kind of stretch beyond the boundaries of normal worship yeah. music? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what made it really exciting to make for me is every day I would come home from the studio and just be like, I am making the music that I love listening to Yeah. and I'm making it like based on my songs and that's just really exciting to me i mean i think a lot of especially a lot of music these days we're we're all borrowing from other sources other sources of inspiration or whatever whether it's in the writing phase or in the production phase or whatever like there's almost nothing new under the sun you know so it's all you know kind of a compliment to these influences that i that i just love that just like make me happy to listen to and so yeah i just I really, really loved making this record. I'm really sad that that part of the process is over. And I'm really excited for people to get to hear that. And and just the sonic landscape that we were able to make and weave throughout the whole thing is really exciting to me, you know? Yeah. Well, Sarah, it's not over. The end of one project (laughs) just... It's the start of the oh. next one, right? I don't know if that gives you anxiety or oh, excitement. Oh, yes, it does. But... <laughs> yes, it does. It does. No, it just because I feel like I, I wrote like over 70 songs for this project. Maybe that's normal for people. It's not normal for me. And I'm not ready to, I mean, I'm just starting to have the inklings of like ready to start writing again, but I'm not there yet. So I'm just allowing myself to just kind of have a little bit of space and enjoy the process of sharing this record and then and then we'll start something new but yeah it's yeah. a mental it's mental gymnastics for sure to be like okay here we go again here we go right but the yeah. work the work never stops 
you know? No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> but you know what? I'm doing what I always dreamed and always wanted to do. Like how yeah. many people can say that? So I'm really grateful for that. Truly. I really am. Yeah. Sarah, yeah. I want to close with this. I want you to encourage the worship leaders, the artists, the songwriters who maybe are feeling like you did when you were younger. Maybe they've been put mm. down by people above them. They lack confidence. They're just not sure. Mm. Cause I really believe this. I, I believe there are so many talented, called gifted people that are sitting on the sidelines and not yeah. fully stepping out into what God's called them to do because of fear. So I, I don't know. I just want you to maybe leave us with a challenge for those that are sort of feeling that maybe a lack of motivation yeah. or just, just fear that's holding them back. What would you yeah. say? Don't let it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I know that's way easier said than done. I think, oh man, there are so many aspects of my life that I look back on so many seasons. I mean, I'm 36 years old. I'm not that old, but I, I have enough of a history now. That's the gift of being in your 30s is you have enough of a history to look back on and recognize all the places where, at least for me, where I allowed fear to keep me on the sidelines over and over and over again. And I wonder, I wonder where I would be today if I didn't allow that to happen. And you know what? I'm, I can't change the past, but I can allow it to shape who I am in the future. And so I would say for anyone out there who's struggling with that, don't, man, don't allow fear. Fear is such a lie. It's such a lie. It is not from God. Don't allow fear to keep you from being, becoming and stepping into who God made you to be. And you have a piece of God's glory. This goes all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. You have a piece. I'm convinced of this. Everyone has a piece of God's glory that they were made to shine in their own unique way. And they were made to share with the world in their own unique way. You have a piece of God's glory in you that only you can share with the world. And so don't let fear keep you from sharing that because it's God's will. <laughs> it's God's will for your life. And you have no idea. You have no idea the the things that he has in store for you. So step into it with boldness, with courage, and say yes every day. That's all we have to do is just say yes every day. Start there. Yeah, it's so good. And I would just add to that, break down a big vision into just the next simple step. You know, exactly. Like I remember when, before I started this podcast and I've been doing this for almost 11 years now and wow, but I was like, okay, what was step one back then? It was like Googling how to start a podcast. Right. <laughs> and I remember like, I, you know, I, I don't know if I took this course or watched this video series yeah. on like all the details of starting a podcast. So I'm just like, okay, I'm going to do it. Right. And it was just the little bit of action. It wasn't this difficult action. Like a difficult action is like, I'm going to make a record. Like if you start with like, I'm going to yeah. make a record that's like overwhelming and you probably never will. Yes. But if you're like, I'm going to yes. finish one song. Yeah. then that's like doable. And then you build confidence as you go. And, and so yeah, for those listening, that's good. find just that. What's the next thing that you can do? Maybe it's a conversation you need to have. Maybe it's like, yep. finish that song you started. Maybe it's like set up a co-write with somebody, whatever it is. Yeah. Just start taking little actions and like little actions that build up over time. You're, you'll look back yeah. and be like, wow, I can't believe. Like you probably feel that like with this project yeah. and this deluxe. I didn't even know there was a deluxe record coming, <laughs> but it's like, wow, how did how did we do that? It was like just a bunch of yeah. action taken, you know? Yes, so. yes. Day, day in, day out steps, yep. little steps. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's great advice. I love that so much. Cool. This has been such a great conversation. Seriously. Thank you so much for yeah. inviting me to, to come on and chat with, talk with you and hang out. It was really, really good. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your time, Sarah. And I look forward to you know, just the release of this album. So make yeah. sure you check it out, Sarah Kroger, wherever you find good music. Are you like put, making CDs and cassettes and vinyl and everything? <laughs> or is this all digital? Um, I'm definitely going to make CDs. I might make vinyl just because the art for this album is incredible. The team that was behind it is just insane. So they made some really beautiful things and I just, yeah, I'm, I've never done vinyl before, cool. but I might for this. So we'll see. 
Yeah. There's something I think you miss in the digital era. I'm going to sound super old here, but like I used to, yeah. I cut my teeth on not so much vinyl, but just like CDs. And I would just listen to like a CD from start to finish. I would pull out yep. the, the booklet and I would study yep. the musicians. I would read every lyric. And yep. I would just like... <laughs> And I don't even do yeah. that anymore, right? Because it's like, oh, Apple Music, Spotify. Let me just, oh, okay, what's the highest, you know, what song has the most listens? Let me listen to that. You know, it's just like, so you miss out, I think, on like the experience I know. of a record. So, I know. Anyway. You really do. You really do. Well, hopefully people will listen to this record from start to finish. Yes. I would appreciate that. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Any last words, Sarah? Anything else that you want our listeners to check out? Like, are you going to be like, doing some touring, anything like yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. Always on the road, but you can find all that good stuff on my website, just sarahkruger.com and come hang out. I'm on Instagram most mostly. That's my kryptonite. That's my place where I like to spend <laughs> my most time. And that's just at S Kroger, K-R-O-G-E-R. And yeah, would love to connect with you and hang out and have conversations. So come hang out. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you, Sarah. So much. Appreciate you. Have a good one. 